Hello there, my name is James Spurin and welcome to this talk on Kubernetes clusters need persistent data. I'm the product evangelist for Storage OS and I have a mixed background that covers a variety of different areas. So enterprise storage, DevOps and software development. I previously worked for Nomura, Goldman Sachs and Dell EMC. Lastly, I'm the author of Dive Into Ansible. Here's an overview of what we're going to be covering in this session. Okay, so jumping into this, how are organizations adopting and using Kubernetes? With our customers, we see a mixture of different approaches and strategies. We have what are the hybrid solutions, ones that could be deployed both on-prem in your own data center or in the cloud. These are clusters that you build and manage yourself using the, the likes of KubeADM. You've also got those being built using Rancher, where Rancher deploys and manages the Kubernetes environment for your target locations. Then you've got the likes of OpenShift that uses Kubernetes at its core, but also acts as a platform as a service. Next, we have the traditional cloud-based offerings of Kubernetes. So for example, your Amazon EKS, your Azure AKS, and Google GKE, just to name a few. We also have environments that may be used by developers more locally on their laptops or local systems. So this could include KubeADM, there's Minikube, there's Kind, and there's other awesome projects like Kubefire. Then, as most of you will know, this is still only a small subsection of the options that are available. And I highlight these to show a consideration I recommend when choosing a persistent storage solution. This presentation is provided to you by the CNCF, Cloud Native Compute Foundation, and choosing a data plane should follow the same principles with a solution being cloud native and able to cover all of the circumstances that you require, i.e. on-prem, bare metal, and in the cloud. If we take a look at the market utilization of Kubernetes and container technologies, there is mostly an emphasis on ephemeral workloads. So the container can be started, stopped, and there's often not a concern for that underlying data. If we look at the top two technologies running on Docker, according to Datadog, both Nginx and Redis are first and second. From a Kubernetes viewpoint, they're great apps for running as ephemeral workloads. So for example, Nginx, it's very easy to run and deploy. And technically, you could do this without storage. You may, for example, use an init container to initialize the content that Nginx serves. And when you want to update, you destroy and recreate. Redis is similar, and again, you can use this without storage. The instances where required, they can sync with other nodes to get shared information. So whilst these ephemeral workloads are often great use cases and are convenient, treating a cluster as ephemeral first can overall be counterproductive. What we see in the industry, whilst Many organizations are adopting Kubernetes in production for ephemeral workloads. They continue to actually support legacy environments for non-persistent workloads. As we know here, Kubernetes as an operating system provides many benefits. You've got your scheduling, your resource utilization, recovery. And if you're having to maintain a legacy environment to support the workloads that you can't run on Kubernetes, then essentially you're doubling the workload of the team. A lot of the cases for retaining a legacy environment unfortunately do relate to persistent storage and they, they can actually be easily addressed with the use of a persistent data layer. 
As well as this, applications may be running in less than optimal ways. So if we go ephemeral first, then yes, we can easily run both Redis and Nginx as per the examples, but having a better tool set in your Kubernetes cluster gives you better options. As we go through this, I wanna show how both of these can be targeted in different ways with an effective data plane. Lastly, you don't need to create a scaffolding to work around the problems of non-persistent storage. And really, people do this and it's painful and ineffective to see. So for example, this is one I found on the internet where to actually work around the problems of storage persistence, no affinity at the bottom there is being used to restrict that volume so that it can only ever run on k 8 node one. Now, it's easy to see why this is a bad idea. What happens if k 8 node one fails? Well, we lose our data, we potentially lose our application. With an effective data plane, you don't need to do workarounds like this and can work more in the Kubernetes way in which you'd expect. So it just works as desired. For me, when I set up a Kubernetes cluster myself, one of the generic steps I often perform is the deployment of a networking technology. I'm a big fan of Weaveworks, and when I use KubeADM as part of my general workflow, I install the network stack. In the very same way, I encourage you as part of your standard Kubernetes deployment to look at solutions that install a data plane in the same manner. Storage OS, for example, installs as an operator and it's a quick one-line installation script. And once installed, this runs as a daemon set. So why would you wanna do this? Essentially, an effective data plane is like a power-up for Kubernetes. You can see here, we've got Mario as Kubernetes, we have the flower as the data plane, and when these are combined, you're essentially running a powered up cluster. When you increase the cluster's tools and functionality, you also increase productivity. So to understand this, let's look at this a little bit closer. A storage class is a standard Kubernetes component that acts as the gateway for storage OS interaction. We use the native Kubernetes CSI driver, so when you're using storage OS, you're using the declarative language as you'd expect to use with Kubernetes. However, with storage classes acting as your gateway, you can use this to promote multi-tenancy and agility in the environment that you're actually working in. So after installing, you may, for example, set up different storage classes. We have a development example here. So in this case, not really concerned about the copies of data, but wish for it to be highly available. Therefore, the pod is killed on one node and it's starting on another, that data is still available. For production, we might have a requirement to take this a little bit further and create two replicas. Taking this further again, top secret, you could have your two replicas. And in addition to this, you have data encryption at rest. Lastly, you could have something like archived where we could utilize compression with a single replica. By doing this, you've essentially created four named components that greatly simplify use. Your users just make reference to this and ultimately they get usable storage, which most of the time is typically what they care about the most. But the specifications on the back end meet the requirements that align to your application and organization. Setting up a storage class is very simple and the following is a template and it's just some minor changes to add parameters. This is the production example and you can see here that we have two replicas. Once set up, you'd utilize this in Kubernetes as you'd expect. So this example here is literally taken from the Kubernetes docs and the only change is to the storage class name. An added benefit with this, you can remove the need to create persistent volumes yourself. 
you just do the claim for what you need and storage OS would manage the persistent volume and its relationship to the claim. Increasing productivity and Kubernetes usage. Many organizations won't move their applications to Kubernetes or the cloud owing to compliance reasons for data at rest. So this is especially prevalent with financial and healthcare organizations. And with storage OS, encrypted data at rest is a single parameter change to the storage class. When we use this, all of our data is encrypted. And we actually have a full blog post showing this functionality in detail where we actually look at a low level and prove that the data is encrypted on the underlying node. So please take a look at that if you're interested. With an effective data plane, running persistent applications is literally as you would expect Kubernetes to do so. You can see in this example, we have a MySQL pod and all we're doing is specifying the volume. Data persistence works as you'd expect it to. I mentioned earlier about how we may architect an application when we're looking at it from an ephemeral viewpoint. However, with Storage OS, we can look at this in different ways. So, for example, we have the opportunity to use Kubernetes read write many volumes. Therefore, all Nginx pods could access and share the same volume. And an update to the data within that volume means that all Nginx containers are also updated, removing the design of having to destroy or recreate pods to initialize an update for a website. Redis natively supports persistent storage, which rapidly improves recovery time. So with a persistent data layer, you could kill a container run in Redis, it could be redeployed elsewhere. And the in-memory keys are repopulated from the persistent storage. And again, we have a detailed reference actually showing this for those who are actually interested. Lastly, other areas such as GitOps are easier to implement with the correct framework. So take, for example, where we spoke about storage classes. I mentioned production, development, top secret, and archive. There is, however, nothing preventing us having a storage class per application. So with this approach, the application declaration stays exactly the same, but we can vary the environment to suit the needs. So let's say, for example, it's a financial application that owing to compliance has to have encryption when running in the cloud. Here, the deployment can be managed with GitOps and the deployment adapts accordingly to the environment. So in this case, we would have the storage class as MyApp1, both on-prem and in the cloud. For the on-prem version, this would actually be running with two replicas. For the cloud version, whilst it has the same name, we could have this with two replicas and encryption. And from a declaration perspective, the application declaration stays exactly the same. And then you can configure your CI CD execution jobs with Git to execute accordingly. Okay, so with that covered, let's have a look at a demo. Okay, so I'm here in my terminal. And if we take a look, I've got a six node Kubernetes cluster. So this is just a standard Kubernetes cluster built with kubeADM. We have the control plane master as the first node. Then we have five worker nodes. And if we just take a look, there's actually not that much running here. This is just, as I say, a base kubeADM cluster. And as I mentioned earlier, I've actually used Weaveworks there for the network. And in this, I have some examples that we're going to actually look through. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to install etcd. So Storage OS uses an independent etcd for its configuration data. And here I'm just using the convenient etcd operator. Um, when actually running this in production, we recommend that you 
configure a high availability etcd cluster but for evaluation purposes this is absolutely fine and you can see at the bottom there we have the endpoint for etcd access so i'm going to be making reference to this as we actually go through next i'm going to install the storage os operator and um, this is quite simple and as per other examples like i said with weaveworks this is just a kubectl create and we're actually doing this straight from the github repository for storage os and that will actually go through in the background and that one execution will set up the infrastructure that's actually required for storage os okay and next we're setting up the storage os credentials so here we're just using um it's nothing special it's just a kubernetes secret and within this we've actually got the api username api password and other settings that are used by storage os now you'll notice there that in this case all of the values are the same and if we just take a look at this all of these are set to the value of storage os so if you're using this in evaluation by all means actually keep this as it is but when you actually use this in production set this to something which is a little bit more secure next we're setting up the storage os cluster so for this we're using the storage os cluster custom resource definition that was actually set up and within this we have a reference to the version of storage os that we're actually installing and there in that kv backend you can see the address is the etcd endpoint that was actually set up in the very first step from a resources perspective we have a very very low footprint there and you can see that quite simply for this we're just requesting 512 megabytes and the use of one cpu core okay this is a convenient script that i have which just literally waits for those components to be available Okay, so now we've created our storage class. So as per what I actually showed there as we were going through the presentation, much of this is actually boilerplate. And then within the parameters section, we have the references for the number of replicas, which we've got to two. So that means one primary copy of data plus two additional replicas. So you've actually got three sources there. And encryption is set to true. If we take a look at the storage classes, we have two listed there. We have fast, which is the default storage class set up by storage OS. So where I was actually going through those different ones, the development, production, top secret and archive, this is equivalent to the development storage class that I mentioned. Then underneath this, we have top secret. Okay, so we create a MySQL PVC and persistent volume. Now, you'll notice there I'm only actually specifying the persistent volume claim. And for the storage class name, I'm making reference to top secret. And again, this is the example that has just been taken from the official Kubernetes documentation. There's nothing really to this. It has a request there at the bottom for 2 gig of storage now if we take a look you can actually see that when we do our kubectl get pv and get pvc we have both a pvc and the persistent volume and this is actually there it's connected to top secret as desired and the uuid which has actually been generated by storage os matches for both the persistent volume and the persistent volume claim so it's a nice and convenient way of actually 
Italian Nosa. And this is an encrypted volume. So if you actually take a look at the persistent volume, so here we're just doing a QCTL describe on the persistent volume, and you'll notice in the annotation section that we have reference to a secret name. Now, this is just a standard Kubernetes secret. And if you actually wished, you could actually remove that secret and that would actually render access to that data as inaccessible. So it's a great way for managing and maintaining encryption within a Kubernetes environment. Okay, so what I'm actually doing here, as I mentioned at the start, this is a six node cluster. The first is the control node, so that's not actually schedulable. Then we have five nodes, five worker nodes. And for the example here, what I'm actually doing is I'm untainting one of the nodes and I'm going to taint the others. So this will actually force the Kubernetes scheduler to schedule any workload that I actually do here to KH2. And I'm doing this implicitly so I can show high availability of data. So let's create a MySQL pod. So this one is pretty straightforward. What we actually have there within the container section, you can see we're using the image of MySQL and version 5.7. We've got an environment block, MySQL allow empty password. There's a port section where it's actually just listening on the standard MySQL port, so 3306. And we have volume mounts, which references var lib MySQL, which is the standard location for MySQL. And at the bottom there, we've got the volume section where we're actually pulling in that persistent volume claim, which is running with storage OS. We take a look. Okay, great. You can actually see there that that is running. And as desired, this is actually running on K8 2. And what I'm going to do, I'm just going to check the logs on that. And Great, that's what I was looking for at the bottom there, MySQL D, ready for connections, and it's actually showing the socket. Okay, so there we're just using the kubectl exec, and we're passing in a chunk of SQL data. So we're creating a database called shop, we're using that shop database, create a table called fruit. Within that, we populate that with some of my favorite fruits. And right at the end there, we're just doing a query to actually prove that that data is there. Okay, so now we delete that pod. And what I'm doing now is I'm adjusting those taints that we actually used earlier. So I'm implicitly tainting K8-2 and I'm untainting K8-3 and then I'm tainting four, five, and six. So next time that scheduler runs, the only one it can actually schedule to is K8-3, which is a different node to where we actually executed previously. And we recreate that MySQL pod, and we just give that a moment to actually start. Okay, so if we check now, We can see that that's running. Again, I'm going to just follow the logs. And great, that's ready for connections. And let's actually check if our data is still available. Okay, so I'm running a check there against that. And you can actually see there it's run a kubectl exec MySQL and we're running a reset query cache and we're doing a select from that shop database and the fruit table and you can see there that all of our data is still available as expected.
So this really highlights how simple it should actually be. And this, whilst this is an example for MySQL, you can apply these same kind of examples to legacy applications or other applications that use operators and have those storage class references. And what I'm going to do now, we've spent a bit of time here where we're actually looking at the CLI and we've been working at a Kubernetes level. Let's take a look behind the scenes within Storage OS. So I've used the convenient kubectl port forward. I love this feature for freeze. And I've just actually forwarded that UI interface of 5705 to the system that I'm working on, K81. So if we take a look at this in a browser, and if you recall, I set up the credentials here as storage OS and the password is storage OS. And here we can actually see now that we have the volume that we've actually created. So this is a two gigabyte volume. It has a replication target of two. The primary node is K82, whilst this is attached to K83. In some instances, these will actually be the same, but with Storage OS, the volume can actually run anywhere and can attach to the node. We use labels much in the same way that is used in Kubernetes, so we follow those standards there. And you can actually see that we have these labels, so encryption is actually true and replicas is set to two there. And if we actually click into this, you can see that again, this is attached there. This is the primary node for this. Then we have our two replicas. So the first replica is running on K8 free and the second replica is running on K8 six. Okay, great. So I hope you enjoyed that. And as you actually go forward and deploy your Kubernetes clusters, I hope after seeing this, you consider a persistent data layer as part of your standard Kubernetes deployment. As you can see here, it really makes life a lot easier in different respects, and it will really help your organization to actually grow its Kubernetes usage. So some further reading here, we have the performance benchmark in cloud native storage solutions. So this was a benchmarking test of ourselves and other persistent storage solutions. That's a very good read. We have the SIVO's lightning fast managed Kubernetes development and deployment resource. So SIVO are uh, another provider who actually offer a cloud managed Kubernetes solution. It's really, really cool. And they actually use storage OS on mass. So some great resources on, on the internet where they actually show that running on bare metal on huge clusters. Definitely worth a look. Uh, some other uh, areas that we've actually got there, we've got the platform architecture overview, there's the documentation. And if you actually want to reach out to us and chat to us a bit further, we have a dedicated Slack group. So by all means, please come and speak to myself, come and speak to our other engineers, and we'd be happy to get you started with persistent storage on Kubernetes.